Now we're going to put a little bit of mathematical clothing on this radioactive decay issue. Talk a little bit about carbon dating and elemental abundances. First, I'd like to talk about the abundances of different isotopes of potassium. This is an illustration of different isotopes. Many atoms have, have different isotopes. Uh, potassium, for example, has uh, at least three isotopes. The white balls represent potassium-39. It has 19 protons and 20 neutrons in its nucleus. And then, of course, for a neutral potassium atom, there will be 19 electrons to balance the 19 protons. 93% um, of the potassium that's found naturally is potassium-39. So that's represented here by these 7,774 balls in this jar. Potassium-41 has two additional neutrons in it, so 22 instead of um, 20. And uh, it's 6.7% abundant, and it's represented by these gray balls and there are 558 of these gray balls. Finally, potassium-40. You'll note that to be potassium, it needs to have 19 protons in its uh, nucleus. So potassium-40 has 19 protons and 21 neutrons in its nucleus. And it's represented here by this red ball its uh, abundance in nature is 0.012%. Very, very small percentage of potassium ions in nature are potassium-40. Potassium-40 of these three is the only one that's radioactive. So it um, spontaneously decays into daughter products. And um, its half-life, life, however, is exceedingly long. It's about one billion years. So if you have 100 potassium-40 isotopes, it takes roughly a billion years for half of those to, to, ra to undergo radioactive decay. So it's not very radioactive, not very dangerous for sure. And that is isotopes of potassium. I mentioned in the video that it produces daughters, so sometimes people refer to the, the potassium as the parent nucleus, and then whatever it, de whatever it decays into is called the daughter nucleus. Two more concepts. This is the first of the two. State the nuclear decay equation. I mentioned in, in the demo that um, the, I, I introduced the concept of a half-life. And what half-life is, if you start off with, well, in this case, uh, 16, um, 16 atoms of a particular radioactive uh, isotope. So this is this, uh, 4 times 4 is 16. And that's represented by this number n naught. That's the initial number of radioactive nuclei at time t equals zero. Then if you wait what's known as the half-life, t one half, then you'll have half the initial number of nuclei left. So in this case we'll have eight radioactive nuclei. So what happened to the other eight that disappeared, well, they decayed into daughter products. Then you wait another half-life. So now this is instead of T one-half, this is two T one-half, uh, two half-lives. Then we will have lost half again of the second amount, which is half of eight, which is four by this time. 
and then wait another half-life and we're down to two, et cetera. This is the prescription for, a, for an exponential decay. And if you, if you go down by half, every even uh, every, during each time interval, each half-life, you go down by half the number of, of atoms. That, w that is what we think of as an exponential decay. And you can actually prove that given this idea of a half-life, you get an equation like this. But it requires the calculus, so we'd have to um, take a step in that direction. So n is the number of radioactive nuclei at time t. So initially, n equals n naught. After one half-life, n equals one half of n naught. After two half-lives, n equals uh, one fourth of, of n. So on the y-axis is n, on the x-axis is t, and it's a decaying exponential. That's why we have this minus sign here. N naught, as we talked about, is the number of radioactive nuclei at time t, or time zero, and n is the number of radioactive nuclei at time t. Lambda is called the decay constant. It's measured in units of inverse seconds. These numbers, by the way, have no units. They're just numbers. It's not meters, not seconds, not anything. It's just a number, straight number. The decay constant has units of inverse seconds, one over seconds, and the time, as usual, has, has uh, units of seconds. So when you multiply lambda by t up here, t is measured in seconds, lambda is measured in inverse seconds, then the seconds cancels the inverse seconds and you have a minus lambda t that's, that doesn't have any dimensions, which is a good thing because you, you've got, when you're taking an exponential, whatever you're taking the exponential of has to be um, unitless. So this is the mathematical description of this curve that we've just shown here. So this concept is to define the half-life and derive its relationship with the decay constant. We've actually defined the half-life already. It's the time required for half of the nuclei to decay. So if we start off with n naught nuclei, then in a half-life we're going to get one half of n naught. So the second half of this concept, after defining the half-life, is to derive its relationship with the decay constant. Let's do that. It's not hard. <coughs> so here's the equation. And we're going to apply this uh, between time t equals zero and time t equals a half life, t one half. Well, when t is equal to the half-life, then at that time, as we showed in the previous slide, n has to be one-half of n naught. So I've just put in one-half of n naught for n. And I'm putting in the half-life, t one-half, in for t. And now what we're trying to do is to find the relationship between the half-life, this t one-half, and lambda. So the rest of this is just math. And um, you can see that there's a, a glorious cancellation. You can divide both sides by n naught, and that leaves us with one-half equals e to the minus lambda t one-half. Now we're trying to solve for t one-half. How are we going to find it? Like we talked about in the last, last semester when we talked about decibels, uh, in order to get what's in here, we're going to have to take the logarithm of both sides of this equation, the natural logarithm, base e. Okay, let's look at the left side first. One of the properties of the logarithm is 
the log of A over B is equal to the log of A minus the log of B. So the log of 1 half is the log of 1 minus the log of 1 half. Property of the logarithm. You might not remember it, but it's somewhere in your past if you don't remember it. Another property of the logarithm, and the real reason why we took logarithm of both sides of this equation, is that if you take the logarithm of an exponential of something, what you get is that something. So the logarithm undoes whatever the exponential does. The exponential does something to this minus lambda t one half, but the logarithm undoes what it does, what, what it's done. So the log of e to the x is just x, and the log of e to anything is just anything, or just that thing. All right, so we're actually pretty close because there's one more property of logarithm that we need. If you recall that the logarithm. If this is x and this is log of x. If x is 1, then the logarithm of 1 is 0. So this guy is now 0. And we have minus log of 2 equals minus lambda t 1 half. So we are almost done. Because I can multiply both sides of this equation by a negative 1 and convert those uh, negatives to positive, and I can solve for t 1 half. And that is the relationship between the half-life and the decay constant. So if, if you tell me one, I can tell you the other using this relationship. Radiocarbon dating uses the principles that we've talked about so far in order to date objects. If an object contains radioactive nuclei, like that potassium, that red potassium atom, when the object is formed, um, and, and for example, we could be talking about uh, materials that are used to form the Earth's crust. So if there's a certain percentage of the material that's radioactive, even if, it, even if it's inside of a solid rock, that, that radioactive decay, it couldn't care less that it's inside of a solid. It goes ahead and it, it decays away. These uh, nuclear reactions are much stronger than anything else that you can deal with. So then, then those radioactive nuclei that were embedded in the rocks or embedded in human organisms like us, <coughs> then the decay of those nuclei marked the passage of time, just like the just like a clock. <coughs> and the measurement of the number of radioactive nuclei that are still present in that, relative to the number present initially, <coughs> and that's a trick for some some elements is knowing what, what the number was initially. But if you compare those two numbers and you know the half-life, then you can back out the age of the object. Because we've got n equals n naught e to the minus lambda t. If we've got the half-life, that gives us lambda. Then the only equation left, you've got n, you've got n naught. The only thing left in there is to solve for t. And that gives you the age of the sample. Very uh, simple uh, process. Radiocarbon dating it uses carbon-14. This is a radioactive nucleus that undergoes beta decay. Beta meaning an electron gets ejected with a half-life of 5,730 years. And this is nice. This is a great half-life. Uh, number one, because uh, carbon is abundant in, in our Earth. And also, f about 6,000 years is a, is a good time scale for things that happen on the Earth. The equilibrium concentration of carbon-14 
is maintained by incoming cosmic rays. So carbon-14, we have carbon all over. There's carbon dioxide in the air. There's carbon in, in uh, a lot of carbon in our bodies. There's carbon uh, in, in nature, in plants and, uh, and things. The, but this carbon-14 is created by incoming cosmic rays. So the sun uh, sends these rays. They come at very high speed and they uh, interact with, with uh, atmospheric particles and create carbon-14. And it is thought, and, and measurements seem to confirm, that the amount of carbon-14 in the Earth's atmosphere is roughly constant. It's, um, so as, as the carbon-14 decays away, its half-life is 5,700 years, then it's replenished by these, these carbon-14 atoms coming, or by the cosmic rays coming in. So, and what's this equilibrium concentration? It's not very much. <laughs> it's one atom of carbon-14 for every 8.3 times 10 to the 11 atoms of the non-radioactive carbon-12. So we're talking about, oh man, a billion billion, something like that, billion times a billion atoms of carbon-12 for every one atom of carbon-14. But since we have so many atoms of carbon-12, there's enough atoms of carbon-14 in order for us to date objects. So how does this work? Living or organisms ingest carbon. We eat it. Um, and and, the, and that the, the carbon that we eat is in leaves, and it's in plants, and it's in animals. Um, we eat that, and we, along with the regular carbon-12, we're getting a little tiny bit of carbon-14 in our bodies. And that's continually replenishing as we, um, as we live. But once we die, we're no longer ingesting anything, and we're no longer getting any more carbon-14, and the cosmic rays aren't reaching us. The cosmic rays only reach the upper atmosphere of the Earth, so there's no way for us to sustain the equilibrium concentration. So slowly but surely, over a period of thousands of years, those carbon-14 atoms inside of our body, or inside any dead body, decay away. And then you can follow this process to uh, get an age of, of the sample. So this is uh, Queen Hatshepsut who ruled in Egypt from 1479 to 1458 BC. And radioactive decay uh, dating, carbon, uh, radiocarbon dating using carbon-14 was one of the methods that was used to uh, determine the age of her remains and which has um, been confirmed by other methods. <coughs> 